Thank you, Wendy, and all of you. Most of moving this. <laughs> Now you know why I uh, came to Parsons in 1965, graduated in 1968, which is why I need the lights up. <laughs> up. <laughs> up. Okay. I can't see. <laughs> um, first of all, I just want to welcome all of you today. Uh, I know you're from many different uh, industries, your grown-ups, your students. So, um, it's interesting they asked me to tell my story because it's an old story, but I think it relates to luxury because I can tell you how I related to my customers for 50 years. And it worked. We didn't have phones, we didn't have this, we had personal attention. And I think just having come from a luxury conference, everybody's trying to figure out how do we put that back? What do we do? You know, even if the customer is young, they now want to be able to talk to somebody once in a while, anyway. And the different tools and the opening and the white space that is available for all of you to solve these problems. But first, I just want to um, talk about today's conference and thank you, the faculty and students in the School of Design Strategies and the School of Fashion who are really leading this um, conference. Also to acknowledge the Luxury Educational Foundation, if there's any of you here in the audience, this has been an amazing collaboration for over the last about 11 years. And I was lucky enough to be involved because a lot of people didn't know about it. And there's nothing better than this pedagogy of what they've accomplished, of studying, um, creativity, where they mix Parson students, and the business side of what they learn at Columbia um, you know, Business School. And when you hear my story, you'll see why not knowing when I went to Parsons, it was all about luxury. You had the finest fabrics you had, you met with, you know, Norman Durrell was one of my critics, and people like that. You had to make clothes so perfectly and beautifully. And you didn't get to make as many. Today, there's so much opening for creativity. But we didn't learn about business. So I'll tell you those stories along the way. Um, and, and so much has changed in the world of retail. And we all think it's changed in luxury. But I don't think it has. Luxury represents heritage. And it's about relationships. It's about the pride of what you wear and how you combine it. And all that's changed, I think, is how you bring it to the customer. So I'm, I'm not a big luxury person because my career was built on, excuse me, covering the asses of the masses. <laughs> that was my goal. But I was raised in luxury. I was lucky. I was born into it. And I grew up watching my mother dress in the most gorgeous couture gowns. Norman Norell, um, Charles James, many people that most of you probably never heard of, but I hope you have. And watching this amazing Charles James dress with hundreds of layers of tulle in many colors and the kinds of things that for so many years haven't been made, but it's, been, it's happening again. And so when I grew up, I thought you had to be a genius to be a fashion designer. Well, I'm not a genius, but I managed to be a fashion designer. So I think you know what we're trying to accomplish today, and I think maybe I can relate it to luxury. And I'm actually wearing luxury today in many different ways, and I'm not usually a name dropper. But today, I just want to show how we all put it together, because I think it's how you put it together. Laying on a chair there, my jacket is Casta Le Jacques. It's 50 years old and fabulous. <laughs> Even my iPad can fit into that. <laughs> Who knew? This is from 1950. <laughs> okay. What else is happening in luxury? And that is how you customize. So I'm wearing a shirt. This is from Muji, okay? I actually bought 20 of them. 
It's the best white shirt. Why did I buy 20? Because last year, every year, I usually teach a class at Parsons, and my class was about adaptable reuse. So I gave each of the students a K younger gown, which they had no clue what to do with, and a white shirt. And I said, find a way to use every single part of the fabric. One student took the dress and turned it inside out and stuffed it into, um, <coughs> stuck the shirt inside and made a backpack. Other people, you know, cut it apart, etc. But it's, it's about all that, so I took this shirt. And then I customized it yesterday. Why? The, the drawings on my shirt are from a faculty member, Johanna Tiss, okay? This, these drawings come from our, I'm chairman of the Board of Parsons, from our board meeting last, um, last year, end of the year. And last night was our first one of this year. So she did whiteboards. And there's a drawing of me on the back, you can come see later on the back left corner. She did drawings of our discussion groups. One was on risk and sustainability, one on storytelling, and I don't even remember what the third one was about. I think health and wellness, which we feel so important. So all I did is take the photographs, print it on transfer paper, design where it went on my shirt, and the gasoline is so much fun. Why do I mention this? Not to pat myself on the back, but to say, I mean, there's a wonderful woman here who's got a bag that's hand-painted canvas. There's so much about today in luxury, it's about customization. And, you know, some of the companies are actually nervous about it because I was at an LVMH conference called DARE, okay? That's why my teacher says, I am K, and on the back, LVMH, DARE. It's, it's about design and risk. It's called, um, I always forget what it is. It's Dare to Stand for Disruption, Act, Risk to Be an Entrepreneur. So, and then my shoes, okay? They are from Froenza Schuller, one of our graduates. We're at the fashion show at the end of the year, the benefit persons. One of our board members, Julie Gilhart, thought their collection was so amazing. Terrific. So, junky t shirt, cheap shirt. And Simone Rochelle pants. Why? Because I can afford to do that with all the rest. So it's the way they're putting it together. And what I learned at this at this um, three-day conference, which was fascinating, I can't tell you much because I had to sign the non non-disclosure paper, oh. <laughs> but I can give you a hint because it's how to deal with your companies. They brought in. 60 of their employees, of which you know LVMH is one of the largest companies and the most successful. So when you think about it, think of LVMH, think of, of Karen, two of the most, I mean, it shows that luxury is surviving. But they brought them in from all over the world and brought me and others as mentors. And each group was randomly put together. They had to come up, kind of like XRC, and come up with new ideas of how to move like luxury forward into the 21st century. And the one thing I learned that I'd like to share with you is, it was shocking to me, 50% of their buying public are millennials. Where did they get the money? That's what I was thinking. So I was looking and thinking as I tried to write some notes about what to talk about today, and it's again about relationships. If you relate to your customer, and you're kind to them, and you explain to them, if they're at all interested, of why this is so beautiful. You get the mom who becomes the grandmother, then you get the daughters, and maybe she's getting a special dress bought by her grandmother for her prom, and then it's her wedding, and then it's her children. It lives within the families. Plus, the millennials, they get married later. They make a lot of money. Many of them make a lot of money. They have more disposable uh, funds than a lot of us do as we get older. So it's not the people like me who are buying the luxury. It's the younger ones. So now just to give you a little picture into why I'm here, why I'm 
So it happens to know why I'm the chair. <laughs> part of it is what I call Parsons' passion. When I came to Parsons, um, after growing up and in luxury, as I explained, when I was eight years old, I got a sewing machine. And I was taught at school, we used to have what was called home economics, which most of you would not know what that is. You learn to sew, and you learn to cook. <laughs> so I wasn't allowed to cook, but I was allowed to sew. And um, when my parents would go to bed at night, I would get up, and I'd take the Cortese, those are fancy bed covers, you know, from the fancy, and I, would, I figured out with no waste how to make skirts. And then I would take my brother's covers and put everybody in the house except for my parents. And they thought the housekeeper was stealing. And I, I would wrap them up and give them for Christmas and Hanukkah presents. Then later, a few years later, I read a magazine how to put a zipper in. So then I attacked the towels. And I learned how to fold the towel in half, make a T, and put a bottom on it, and put a zipper up the front. By that time, my parents finally figured out, send this girl to art school. And I figured I would be a painter. So I went to Washington University in St. Louis as a painter. But I knew that I always wanted to support myself. Even though I was brought up with everything, it didn't make me feel secure. It actually made me feel insecure. And sometimes even embarrassed. And I would look at the amount of clothing that I brought to wash you. It had to be put under everybody's bed. And maybe other people came with a small amount. And that's where I think I got this concept. Maybe someday, if I do become a designer, I can offer to millions what I was lucky enough to have, which is beautifully designed clothing, well-made, that fit beautifully, and that's eventually what I did. So then I met my first husband, who was an architect, and he was from Houston. And I said, I'm never going to live in Houston. So there's no fashion in Houston. And um, it, how about you go, he was a little bit older than I was, you go to New York, get a job, and I'll see if I can get into Parsons. You know, it's so hard. But that's how I got here. And I literally cared enough about it that I had to be a freshman three years in a row. Once a freshman is a painter, I was a freshman in fashion design at Wash U, and then persons would never accept my credits. So I was a freshman in fashion. But it was only three years then. And you have to envision this. I arrived at Parsons School of Design, which was then on East 54th Street. I had a goof on hair, they were a little fuller than today. And I kind of look like a cross, sort of like Mary Tyler Moore. Or I would like to think Jackie O. I literally wore a pillbox hat. I was like, you know, I had a little Jeffrey Bean Christie dress, and I wore white gloves. <laughs> well, that lasted about a week. I can't say I ended up looking like the Parsons students today because my hair was never pink, green, orange, or, sh or chartreuse. But it was in thousands of braids. It changed every week. And it was a great education, and Norman Norell was one of my credits. And that was an exceptional experience. So I graduated, and my first big job was with Jeffrey Bean. So I started in that luxury world. And what I did is, and I, by the way, I was his assistant along with Issei Miyake and Michael Bolbrock, who unfortunately recently passed away, who was in my class at Parsons along with Willie Smith. And I would watch, we sit in the same room every day, and they would roll in one dress and hundreds of buttons and hundreds of ribbons and so on. And I would watch how they work on it. And many times at the end of the day, the dress was the same. But I kept watching and thinking, I can make this dress for so much less. This kind of clothing could be for so many. From there, I went to what was called Trina Norell. So it started by Norell with, with Teal Trina. They already did my own collection. And it was still luxury. And again, that idea through my head, and I became very famous, and was on the, more famous certainly than now. And I was on the cover of Harper's Bazaar, Women's Wear Daily, et cetera. But after a year and a half, a company offered me the opportunity to, they said, make whatever you want. You could turn that down. Unfortunately, I ended up making like tracksuits. Now those are cool. Then it wasn't cool. <laughs> and while I was at Parsons, my father passed away. 
What I did not know is that he had left me some money. It didn't come to me until later. And actually, I had to give scholarship while I was at Parsons because I was married and my mother believed married girls in those days stayed home. And I said, no, 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 I'm staying in school. And I got two wonderful scholarships here. Anyway, when I was 25, I got a check in the mail for $25,000 that my father had left me. And I'm like, oh my god, what do I do with this? And the people from Liberty of London, beautiful printed fabrics, at that time it wasn't well known. They came to me because I always did colorful clothing. And they said, hey, would you consider using Liberty of London fabrics in your collections? You do such a beautiful job and it's not being used in America, it's only being used like by Cacherelle in France. And I said, sure. I took my $25,000 check, deposited, went to Liberty of London and bought $20,000 worth of assorted prints in cotton and cotton foil. And, and at night, I started my own business. Everybody knew me, and I learned one important thing, which I'm sure all of you know, which somebody taught me. I kept a little book of everybody I met along the way, and I was nice to everyone. Because the person who delivered the clothes from Vogue was then my editor. All those things. And in the early days, I kept a day job to pay, you know, to live. In the night job, I went to one of the factories I had found. And I used to package the clothing in my home. And I would, what I didn't understand, because I knew nothing about business, was that I had set up a situation for what's called dating. I'd already paid for the fabric. I bought enough fabric to last me almost two years. So I didn't have to pay for the fabric. Therefore, in those days, I would get package it, get on my bike, and go to Bloomingdale's. And they would meet me at the back door with a check for the clothing. I would then deposit that and pay the contract. And it was terrific. About a year into that, though, I figured, I don't know what I'm doing. I didn't know how to cost a dress. I'm, to figure out what the yardage was, but I didn't know what a she. I knew nothing about business. I mean, I'd hold the dress up and say, what do you think I should charge? <laughs> and so, I kept getting calls from people I'd met along the way, we'd like to be your partner. Well, that was probably my first mistake, but anyway. <laughs> because I think what I learned was, had I gone a little bit longer, I probably would have stayed by myself. And I had some interesting partner issues as time went on. But anyway, I had them join my business, and I ended up calling it Gillian for almost 23 years. And it was interesting. We built that into, in those days, that business started in around 1970. We, we built it to a $125 million business with 300 employees. What made it work? Um, one, Clothing was made, and I learned this actually later when I did do luxury for several different people. It was always beautifully made, originally in America, and then in Korea, and then in China. So my clothing was as pretty as the things I had from Jeffrey Dean. The insides were great, and the one thing I knew how to do was design a dress. It's real, in those days, it was very popular to design sportswear. Sports was easy to fit. Look at me, I'm wearing all the different pieces. A dress has to fit, and no one in those days actually knew how to do that. And someone I worked with taught me who went to Parsons in the 40s, and how a dress had to hang from the shoulders, and how for women, our waists are in different places, and how to make it fit. And I learned how to make clothing that fit every different nationality. Because I'm Jewish, okay? We have hips. We love to eat. If you're black and African American, you usually probably have a butt, or if you don't have one, you want one. So what didn't go in the hips went into the butt. And for the Asian population, I had the petites, and then I always did um, large sizes. So this understanding, and also for 49 years, I traveled 30 weeks a year and went into dressing rooms of every everywhere I went, and what that taught me and what I think is so important to luxury, you have to know your customer. Don't tell her what she has to wear. Listen to her. And I would learn like what the issues are. 
And, you know, women with vasectomies, I, I found ways to cover them in a way they could look beautiful for their daughter's wedding, etc. And um, it just, the interesting thing was, you know, I, I'm more than willing to share that it wasn't all great. So after 23 years, my partner embezzled all the money and we went bankrupt. Two weeks later, we started KO in New York. And um, my manufacturer from Korea walked in with a million dollar check and said, if you'll go back into business, we'll back you. But what I learned from that is, again, relationships. When I couldn't, when I couldn't ship everything, because I was going out of business, I actually went to my competitors. Here's my orders, fill them. And I was doing business for Talbots and, you know, um, the limited and private label for Nina Marcus and all that. I gave it all away. So two weeks later when I reopened and had some product that was already in the factory, one, I only chose what I thought was the most beautiful. My business had become so large, it was about real estate and not beauty. They say sometimes the department store business is insurance and real estate. I didn't want a part of it. I said I wanted to dress people for their lifestyle or would not go back into business. So I did that for uh, 17 more years until recently. But anyway, along the way, here's a story, a bizarre story I'd like to tell you what I think about luxury. So after 9-11, which was so horrible, especially to New Yorkers, I wanted to do something. By that time, our clothing was being made in Korea and China. So I opened a collection just called Onger, which was sort of my dream. Because I made clothing that actually I would wear, but it wasn't me. I'm a little wilder or a little more classic. But I understood what the woman needed. This was for women going back to work. They'd lost their husbands. They had to help support their families. And what I did, I used the finest double-faced wool that had stretch in Italy. And it was in red, black, white, and a neutral color. And I bought enough fabric so that the fabric could be used season after season, season so they could mix and match. Beautifully cut dresses, coats, and so on. And the only really fun thing I did, I mean, they were terrific, were these net tattoo printed long sleeve tops, kind of like Gautier does. Only I lined them so you didn't have to see through them so these women could wear it to work. So only about a year ago, I went to a funeral, and I'm in a car with some of the people I didn't know. I introduced myself, and this woman goes, oh my god, oh my god, you're Kay Unger? I said, yeah, why? Oh, I have these dresses from your Unger collection that I love so much. And I was very grateful, and we went to the cemetery, and then I went off to the person's home to see his wife, and this woman went home and literally changed clothing and put the dress and coat on to come back and show me how she felt. So I'm not talking about this in an egotistical way. I'm trying to explain what you can bring to a customer. And the other thing is, I helped, I don't know if it's good or bad to admit this, but I'm the one who launched Marquesa. So, okay. <laughs> Uh, Harvey never bothered me. Maybe that's, I should consider that an insult. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, I have to say that Georgina Chapman and Karen Price, um, Harvey brought them to me because even Marcus said, which is interesting, he, he had just met Georgina and he brought her sketches to even Marcus and he wanted Carolina Herrera to produce it. And they said no, and Neiman said, the only person qualified to produce a quality garment for less money is Kay Unger. So of course he had to schmooze me and be nice and the whole thing, and get my son a sad card, give me a membership to Soho House, so for me that was a good deal. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, working with Georgina and Karen was really a um, fabulous experience because it brought me back to that high luxury world and I literally personally sold the line to Neiman Marcus myself and made the first collection. We hand dyed everything, 
hand embroidered, um, drew everything. I mean, Georgina, I have to say, had very little experience. Both of them were trained in London on how to make a corset. And I learned things from them that were so interesting. It was, it was really a wonderful experience. But what I'm trying to tell you is that we made their clothes in the same factories we made ours. So my dress might be 300, theirs was 3,000, 5,000. So luxury comes in many different ways. And I know I only have a little time left, so what I want to leave you with is the future of luxury. And obviously it's doing so well now, and I think it always will. The heritage of it, as I mentioned before. Relationships. And I want to talk about solving the sustainability waste problem. I was so appalled at this conference to hear so much about trying to figure out what to do so you don't destroy luxury products because you don't want it to, you know, get into the lower market or go to the, you know, it's going to the real real whether they like it or not. And then the customer from the real real is taking and having, having it customized somewhere else. And so we teach here at Parsons all about adaptable reuse. And when I had my, I had a company in Israel as well. And what we did is out of the waste, it was all knits and wool, we made snakes multicolored snakes from all the scraps and gave them away at Christmas and holiday time. What you could do with a Louis Vuitton handbag and make the little wallets and the whole thing, there should never be waste. And many years ago, um, Parson LVMH gave handbags and raincoats um, from uh, Mark Jacobs to Parson's students to remake. They made costumes for and they were unbelievable. And then the Mass School of Music wrote the music and they performed. Anything can be done. And design is about solutions, action, business, sustainability. And I think luxury is the best example of how to do this. Thank you. Thank you, Kate, for a very inspiring.